Hello, I am Dr. Carrie Padgett, a supervising public health biologist at the California Department of Public Health. I am honored to present today's Lunch and Learn presentation on behalf of the Pacific Southwest Centers of Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. The Western continental United States is distinct from the rest of the country in terms of tick species and tick-borne diseases. Today, you're going to hear about exciting research on Rocky Mountain spotted fever on the southwestern border, about Lyme disease ecology and the role of lizards, and about emerging tick-borne diseases such as Borrelia miyamotoid disease, all from the PACVEC researchers conducting this work. Within the continental Pacific Southwest region, we have 48 tick species, seven of which commonly bite people. In this region, we have the Western black-legged tick, which is the vector of Lyme disease to people in the West. This tick species is closely related to and looks very, very similar to the black-legged tick in the Eastern part of the country. Other tick species of public health concern include the Rocky Mountain wood tick, the Pacific Coast tick, and two soft tick species, one that transmits tick-borne relapsing fever to people, and the other is called the Pajuelo tick. Like other parts of the country, we also have two tick species that are commonly found on dogs. We have the American dog tick and the brown dog tick. Thank goodness we do not have the Lone Star tick nor any records of the invasive Asian longhorn tick. While Lyme disease is the most commonly reported tick-borne disease here in the West, and the number of reported human cases is relatively low compared to the Northeast and the Upper Midwest. What we lack in reported cases, though, we make up in terms of tick-borne disease diversity. Some of the tick-borne diseases that we have here in the West include Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Pacific Coast tick fever, tularemia, babesia, anaplasmosis, Colorado tick fever virus, tick-borne relapsing fever, and possibly Borrelia miyamotoid disease. PACVEC researchers working along with the CDC and the California Department of Public Health are conducting focused research on some of these tick-borne diseases here in the West, including Rocky Mountain spotted fever, babesia, Pacific Coast tick fever, and Borrelia miyamotoid disease. We at the California Department of Public Health support the work done by the PACVEC Center of Excellence researchers to conduct focused work on tick-borne diseases here in the West that can translate to clear and scientifically based public health prevention messages to the public as well as healthcare providers. Together, PACVEC researchers, the CDC, the California Department of Public Health and our vector control partners are training the next generation of medical entomologists to work in a One Health framework. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Andres Lopez. I am a postdoc at UC Davis in Janet Foley Lab. I got my PhD degree from the University of Mexico on vector-borne pathogen and wildlife mammals on the U.S.-Mexico border region in northwestern Chihuahua, Mexico. In addition, I have been working in the ecology of other vector-borne pathogens along the western U.S. borderline in Sonora and Baja California. In this section, we are going to talk about some aspects of the ecology and epidemiology of spotted fever rickettsiosis, and more specific about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is a potentially fatal disease of dogs and people caused by the bacterium Rickettsia rickettsii. A long Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is one of the most important vector-borne diseases in North America. The number of spotted fever rickettsiosis cases in the U.S. has increased from less than 500 cases in 2000 to more than 6,000 cases in 2017. However, most people in the U.S. are not aware that Rocky Mountain spotted fever has been around for at least a century. The disease was first reported in the western U.S., but it has become more common in the East. The main vector of the Rocky Mountain spotted fever is north, in northern and eastern U.S. is the American dog tick. However, when the disease emerged in Arizona in 2003, it was transmitted by another tick vector species, the, the brown dog tick. This is the tick species currently responsible for an ongoing outbreak in northern Mexico. So I'm going to share one 
Okay, so the map shows uh, some of the region of and cities where Rocky Mountain spotted fever has reported in the state along the western region of the U.S.-Mexico border. As you can see, in Arizona from 2003 to 2018, about 430 cases were reported in reservation, while there are several rural and urban areas in Mexico, such as Mexicali, Hermosillo, and Ciudad Juarez, where several cases are reported every year. One, two, three. In addition, as you can see, some studies on ticks collected from domestic and wild animals have been found other spotted fever rickettsia, species different than rickettsia rickettsii, in different locations of northern Mexico, such as rickettsia parkeri and rickettsia felis. This spotted fever rickettsia species cannot be distinguished from rickettsia rickettsii using serological test, testing. So it's possible that the current statistic on human cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever include cases of other spotted fever rickettsia. So now Janet is gonna is going to talk about other aspects of. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that our lab has been doing to study the rickettsia problem in southern United States, southwestern United States, and northern Mexico. Hi, everyone. I'm Janet Foley. I'm a professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis, and I am the tick lead for the PACVEC uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, Andres, can you uh, show the slide right before this one? Yeah, thank you. So we weren't really involved in the Arizona investigations. Those were done before our lab started doing research in uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, but on the map, you can see the state, the Mexican state of Baja California, um, which is adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. And two, probably most of the people on the call realize that the two really big cities in Northern Baja, California, that um, are on the border with the United States are Tijuana in the West and Mexicali in the East. And both of them are experiencing Rocky Mountain spotted fever epidemics, uh, Tijuana to a lesser extent, and Mexicali, the epidemic has been going on for um, five or six years now and has infected hundreds of people and has a very high case fatality rate, so the fraction of people who die. And prior to the outbreak in Mexicali, just prior, the state of Sonora, um, just a little bit east of Baja California, also recognized severe outbreaks of Rocky Mountain spotted fever centered around the city of Hermosillo. And in Sonora, some of the work that was published suggested that underlying problems included dogs that were stray, a um, lot of dogs that were not owned or were not receiving regular veterinary care or having tick control done on them. Um, and also lower socioeconomic status was associated with the problems in Hermosillo, um, possibly because of uh, landscape issues, uh, things that promote the tick numbers, and also because um, people in lower, lower socioeconomic status may not have um, access to the medical care that would allow them to make early diagnoses and treatment. So as the epidemic really expanded in Mexicali, um, we were invited by collaborators to help out. So the first studies that our lab did um, had, or, had been, um, the research had already been started uh, at the Uni Autonomous University of Baja California uh, by collaborators in the vet school there who had um, done PCR testing on dogs and people thought to have Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So the first thing that we did is we confirmed those PCR tests in people and documented that the rickettsia um, was in fact the cause of the disease and in some cases fatalities in Mexicali. Um, and then we did DNA sequencing to evaluate the relationship between the rickettsia in Mexicali with other uh, rickettsias that have been uh, reported elsewhere. Uh, so that was the first step. And then the second step was a um, bigger study um, that I led collaboratively with more than 80 
uh, Mexican students from UABC. Um, these students were from the medical school and the veterinary school, um, and they worked in teams. So a real one health approach, learning from each other. Uh, wow. We also had faculty from both schools and collaborators from the Imperial County Health Department, CDC, and um, the Baja California uh, Health Secretary. Um, so we went, uh, we, it was a randomized design and we went door to door uh, asking if people will, were willing to participate in the study. And uh, if they were, they were given a questionnaire to assess their knowledge and perspective about rickettsia. Um, in the end, actually, people were quite knowledgeable that there was a fatal tick-borne disease in their neighborhoods. But again, associated with lower socioeconomic status, many people were not able to um, do much about it or use routine tick preventive drugs on their dogs. Um, we also collected ticks from the environments and from the dogs, and we um, collected blood samples from the dogs to assess how many dogs had already been exposed. In some neighborhoods, more than 80% of the dogs had been exposed and had antibodies to rickettsia rickettsii, which shows you that the pathogen, the tick infestation and the pathogen had covered very large amounts of the city and the nearby rural agricultural valley. Um, there are certain neighborhoods that had a higher uh, prevalence, higher rate of infection in dogs. Um, but then when we looked specifically at the ticks and the dogs, we would find that the infection itself um, was no longer present in most neighborhoods. And it's it was very focal. So there would be an area of just a few blocks, city blocks, where you would see a large number of the ticks would have the active infection. Um, so it, you know, one of the things we think might be happening is that it's a dynamic, a spatially dynamic process. So any given neighborhood has a small local epidemic that many of the ticks are infected. That's a very high risk neighborhood. Um, and then probably some kind of herd immunity kicks in. A lot of the dogs develop the infection, become resistant over time, recover and become resistant. And then that neighborhood is probably safe for a couple of years until the number of unprotected dogs starts to come up again. And those unprotected dogs could be dogs that are um, transported into the area or puppies that are born into the area. So uh, th this was, a, we felt, an important first step first of all, to really solidify the collaboration with the people in Mexico, um, and also to um, help us understand the landscape in Mexicali. So after, um, after uh, doing that, we really tried to focus a little bit more on the brown dog tick uh, ecology in Mexicali. Um, the, one of the issues is, does the brown dog tick, you know, as the name suggests, really only feeds on dogs, but is there a wildlife reservoir in Mexicali? And that's something I know you're under, under sir, interested in, in studying further. Um, we know that this tick will feed on people. That's how it can infect people. So later in this hour, we'll hear about one of our graduate students' studies thinking about um, comparing the biting rates on people and dogs of brown dog ticks from Mexico. Um, and then, the last um, kind of component of understanding the ecology is the actual ecology of the tick on dogs. So, um, Andres, I think you you led this paper that just um, was just accepted for publication, and I think it would be neat to hear more about our dog demography study. So, um, um, we conduct a study in rural and urban location of Mexicali to investigate whether or not movement pattern and demography of dogs can affect the ecology of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. To accomplish these goals, we conduct a household survey and track movement pattern of 16 dogs using a GPS data logger. So what we found here were three main results. First of all, dogs in high risk area had higher reproduction rates. Second of all, there was a higher proportion of younger dogs and lower proportion of older dogs in high risk area. And finally, there was an increase of space, of space use of free roaming dogs in high risk area. So overall, our conclusion highlights that the high proportion of puppies in high risk area could result in a lack 
of herd immunity leading to a higher risk of disease in dog and human population. And finally, given the increase of movement pattern, the unrestrained dogs could, could play an important role in spreading ticks and pathogens in Mexico. So um, these this studies um, give us a really good insight about the ecology of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in Mexicali. Um, this is the first report of uh, dogs, the effect of dogs in this system. So this is important for taking some decision, policy maker decision, can use this information to uh, control the disease by neutering or spaying dogs. Uh, Great, thank you. Good luck. So, yeah, I think that it, I think well, well, data, yeah, I think the data really highlight how important it is to enact policies um, on the way that dogs are moved, both in the neighborhood, whether the dogs are allowed to to go in the streets and be stray, and that is um, a particularly common practice in some of the rural and agricultural areas. Um, and not to say that they couldn't have their dogs. Um, able to go outside fenced yards, but in those cases, it would still be important that the dogs are protected from being hit by a car and also protected from tick, infest from tick infestation, which you can do with um, topical products that kill ticks. So I think that's a really important part of it. And then it's so important to show that spaying and neutering the dogs um, can help bring that herd immunity um, and now that people are becoming really familiar with the concept of herd immunity, because we hear about it all the time in the COVID epidemic, I think the listeners are going to really understand that by staying and neutering um, and hopefully stopping the constant uh, turnover of lots of new non-immune puppies, we can potentially make a dent in the epidemic. Um, we, our group is not focused on making a vaccine, but there may be um, the opportunity for a rickettsia vaccine in the future. Um, there are research groups doing that. And then I think the last, in addition to targeting work on dogs, um, one of my goals this year and next would be to do more work on effective tick control. The brown dog tick can be a really hard tick to eradicate from an environment. Um, it lives in cracks in cement, cracks in stucco. It can live in dirt on the ground. Um, and you can spread, and there's some evidence that some uh, populations are resistant to the pesticides that we use. So you can go, you can spray pesticide all over the area. And if you don't, if the pesticide doesn't penetrate into the areas where the ticks are hiding, um, and the ticks are not resistant to the drugs, if they are resistant to the drugs, then you can expect the infestation to last. And maybe a week later, ticks are there and coming back out again and, and looking for a blood meal. So uh, there's definitely some work that can be done on uh, different kinds of pest management and evaluating the effectiveness of the current practices that are used in Mexico and the United States, because the brown dog tick is also present in California and Arizona as well. And um, in places where people describe having serious infestations, getting rid of those infestations can be really difficult. So that's an area of research. Um, I think that just in closing, one of the messages I wanted to get across is, of course, you know, I am a researcher and I'm very interested in rickettsia and rickettsia research, um, but seeing the magnitude of the impact that this disease has on communities in the United States and uh, Mexico, it was really important to us that we do applied research that will directly translate into um, medical, medical improvements or policy improvements that can improve the quality of life for the dogs and the people. So with that, I'm going to close out and um, thank people for listening. You'll hear more about Rocky Mountain Spotted Beaver and Dog Ticks later. Um, and Andres, thank you so much for telling us about your very interesting research. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. So. Bye. All right. Hi, I'm Maureen Brophy. I'm an entomology PhD candidate at the University of Arizona in Kathleen Walker's lab. I'm studying how differences in brown dog tick DNA may change how well they carry diseases. This is Laura. 
Hi, I'm Laura Backus, and I'm a graduate student in Janet Foley's lab at the University of California, Davis. I study the epidemiology of tick-borne diseases, and today I'm going to be talking about how temperature may affect how brown dog ticks bite humans and transmit diseases to humans. So the brown dog tick, Rupacephalus sanguineus, is found just about all over the world and can carry a bunch of different pathogens. In some parts of Central and South America, this tick transmits Rickettsia rickettsii, which is a bacteria that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever disease in humans and dogs. In the United States, it's only been found to transmit this disease on tribal land in Arizona, so I want to know why. There are some risk factors for tick infestations in RMSF that are pretty straightforward. In Arizona, our weather is warmer and drier, which means that ticks can be active year round. We also, because of this, tend to have more stuff and clutter outside because it won't be as affected by precipitation. And this stuff can harbor ticks when they're off the host and provide suitable ground for them to lay their eggs and um, get away from the warm heat. The tribal land is also unique in that there, there tend to be large dog populations, which are oftentimes free roaming or off the leash. And there's less access to veterinary care and spay and neuter services, which leads to more dogs and dogs that tend to not be quite as healthy. And there are also fewer resources such as waste disposal, which means that people tend to have more stuff. One of the really interesting things though, is that the brown dog tick is actually two separate lineages, um, a temperate and a tropical lineage that have different ecological ranges. They look nearly identical and have the same life cycle and habits, but they're actually rather distinct genetically speaking. And there's been some research to suggest that the two lineages differ in their ability to transmit some diseases. We don't actually know if this is true for RMSF yet or not, but we can start by looking at the distribution of the two lineages. So the tropical lineage is found near the equator and further south because it's more adapted to heat. In most of North America, we have the temperate lineage, which likes cooler weather. But to make things even more interesting, there are a few parts of the United States that actually have both lineages, including here in Arizona. So one of the goals of my research is to evaluate the distribution of the temperate and tropical lineages across Arizona and see if the tropical one is being found where we have RMSF transmission. And if so, is it going to continue moving northward as the climate warms up? So in order to do this, I've gotten to collect ticks from all across Arizona on dogs. And then I end up crushing up the ticks in order to study their DNA. So we haven't been able to finish looking at all of this data yet, but we're starting to see an expected pattern. Temperate ticks are being found in the northern part of the state at higher elevations, shown here on this map in the light shades of blue. And then the tropical ticks are actually being found farther north than we thought that they would be, but they're still down in the southern part of the state in the dark blue. And there are some counties shown here in the medium shades of blue where we've actually found, found both lineages. And in a few cases, we've even found both lineages on the same dog. So this information may be important in understanding and predicting the risk of RMSF here in Arizona. Another good way to predict disease is to have a better understanding of the prevalence of ticks in an area. So part of my research is more public health than actual bench science. There are a few places in the country that actively do tick surveillance, but they often use the flagging or dragging methods, which tend not to work as well on brown dog ticks. So when they use tick traps in other parts of the country, they're often baited with dry ice in order to lure ticks in using carbon dioxide. While this works pretty well, dry ice is very hard to find in rural areas, which we have a lot of here in Arizona. So I'm testing a new design, a new design for traps that uses common household ingredients to attract ticks using um, household ingredients to create carbon dioxide. I hope to have more answers on this by next year. And on to Laura. Thanks, Maureen. That is really exciting. So one of my interests is in the eco-epidemiology of tick-borne disease. So that's the relationship between ticks, their hosts, the environment, and how that can lead to disease. So Maureen just introduced the different genetic lineages, the tropical lineage and the temperate lineage of the brown dog tick, and how we think there might be differences in how they behave and transmit diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
So she's interested in the genetic differences and the ability to transmit disease and their distributions. What I wanted to know is the answer of whether hotter temperatures increase the brown dog tick's preference for human hosts and whether there's a difference between the lineages, whether the tropical lineage might be more active in biting humans at hotter temperatures. So how could we test this? How could we measure whether ticks would use dogs or humans? We designed and built this device to allow the ticks to choose between a human and a dog. It has two large boxes that are connected by clear plastic tubing. The human sits on one side, the dog sits on the other side. Small fans ensure that air and scent flows from the boxes into the tubes. Those are on the doors. There's mesh at either end of the tube, so the ticks can't actually get to the human or the dog. The goal isn't to see whether or not the ticks bite, just which host they choose. We put the tube ticks in the tube at the center and then count how many go towards the human or the dog over 20 minutes. If a tick moves more than halfway between the center and the dog and the, or the human, we count it as having made a choice. We perform the test at room temperature, about 20 to 3 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit and 38 degrees Celsius, which is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit and compared the results. Now to see this in person, we'll watch a video. Here's Cassidy, one of our dog volunteers. He goes in one side, gets a cookie. We turn on the fan, then close the door. Here's a human volunteer going in the other side and closing the door. These are adult ticks in the tubes that we store them in. We open that tube and then tap them into the large tube that runs between the two boxes. Cap it so they don't get out. And then we watch and count how many ticks go either direction towards either the dog or the human. What do our results show? We saw that at hotter temperatures, more adult ticks chose humans over dogs than at room temperatures. This was true for both lineages. For adults, the results are pretty clear. The, for the temperate lineage, hotter temperatures increased the number of ticks going towards humans by 20.5%, while the tropical lineage, hotter temperatures resulted in 18.5% more ticks. Going towards humans. For the nymphs, the results are a little bit less clear, and that's partly because at hotter temperatures, nymphs were less likely to choose a host at all. Overall, though, this means that humans may get bitten more often by brown dog ticks when the weather is hot, which is important for both seasonal predictions and climate change models. This effect is consistent between the lineages, which suggests that hotter temperatures might increase disease risks in humans anywhere where the brown dog tick is found. We can take this information and use it to predict outbreaks of disease like Rabbit Creek Mountain Spotted Fever in areas where the brown dog tick is a vector. Now, before we take this and turn it over to our next speaker, I wanted to show you a video of one of our brown dog ticks molting from a nymph to an adult. And After the brown dog tick feeds as a nymph, it curls up and looks a little like a potato bug. It doesn't move for about three weeks. After sitting there for about three weeks, they then begin to emerge, shedding their old exoskeleton. And that's what's happening in this video. This video is shortened and sped up by about four times. This whole process for them to emerge takes about an hour. He'll free himself from his exoskeleton, and then our adult tick is up and ready to move. While hearing about the other tick associated risks in the West is very interesting and really important, we are all here today because it is Lyme Disease Awareness Month. So in this section of the webinar, we're going to talk about Ixodes ticks and their role in Lyme disease transmission in the West. I'm Emily Pascoe and I'm a postdoctoral researcher studying tick ecology at PACBEC at the University of California, Davis. And I'm joined by a few other experts on this topic. Hello, I am Andrea Sway, Associate Professor of Biology at San Francisco State University. I work on the ecology of tick-borne diseases. 
Hello, my name is Sharon Bremet, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of California, Davis, with a research focus on the human surveillance of tick-borne diseases in California. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Andrews. I'm a public health biologist with the Vector-Borne Disease Section at the California Department of Public Health. So Andrea, I know that you've been researching host communities and how they can affect disease transmission, and it'd be really great to hear what you've found. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Emily. As we've heard, ticks transmit Lyme disease and many other nasty diseases. But with a few exceptions that we will learn about later, ticks don't start their lives infected. They have to acquire the bacteria by feeding on a blood meal host. Ixodes ticks that transmit Lyme disease feed on a wide variety of hosts that can vary in how well they transmit the pathogens, like the one that causes Lyme disease. Let's take a look at the tick life cycle to understand this a little bit better. Ixodes pacificus, the western black-legged tick, has three post-egg life stages, larva, nymph, and adult. Each of these life stages needs to take a single blood meal to survive and mold to the next life stage. The larval blood meal is key to understanding the transmission ecology of Lyme disease because it is the first tick stage that can become infected with the Lyme disease pathogen. The next stage, the nymph, is the most important for transmission to humans because they are so small and people may not notice them and they're also more likely to be infected in the West. Larvae tend to feed on small animals like wood rats, lizards, and squirrels. In the West, the most important sources of the Lyme disease pathogen are dusky-footed wood rats and western gray squirrels. So when these species are common, more larvae will tend to feed on them and the disease risk is predicted to be higher. Lizards, on the other hand, feed a lot of ticks but can't maintain or transmit the Lyme disease pathogen. And I'm really glad that you've just mentioned that ticks feed on different animals like wood rats and squirrels because these animals host different types of Borrelia too, which I will talk about a bit later. My lab studies how host community composition affects disease risk. Recently, we've been exploring how predator diversity affects Lyme disease risk. Using wildlife cameras that we set up at our field sites, we monitored predators and found that sites with more predator activity had lower numbers of ticks on wood rats and mice. These results suggest that the presence of predators can change the behavior of small mammal hosts so that they encounter ticks less frequently. This may translate to lower disease risk as, and it is an active area of research right now. And I can't talk about the host community ecology of Lyme disease in California without mentioning the role of lizards like the western fence lizard shown here. The arrows point to where ticks are feeding on this lizard. They particularly like the ear and nuchal pockets. Western fence lizards are important in the West because they have proteins in their blood that kill the Lyme disease pathogen. Any infected ticks that feed on a lizard will be cleared of their infection by these proteins. This is one of the reasons why it is thought that fewer ticks are infected on the West Coast. But the story is more complicated than that. It's true that when ticks feed on lizards, it kills the bacterium. But lizards also feed a large portion of the tick population and may be important for maintaining high tick densities. Together with some colleagues, I tested the net effect of lizards on tick populations. To do this, I removed lizards from a bunch of sites and looked at what happened to the tick populations compared to control sites. When lizards were removed, there was a big drop in the tick population and also in the population of infected ticks. So the role of lizards is complicated, and in certain cases, their presence may actually increase disease risk. More recently, I have been investigating the tick microbiome, the community of bacteria harbored by ticks. This figure shows the result of an experiment where we found that ticks that fed on lizards harbored fewer bacterial species compared to ticks that fed on mice. We're not sure what these differences mean yet, but the studies are finding that bacteria in ticks may affect their ability to acquire and transmit pathogens, known as their vector competency. Students in my lab were investigating this important question using next generation sequencing techniques. In addition to the role of host diversity on Lyme disease risk that I just described, there's also a diversity of tick species and pathogens in the West that can shape disease risk. That's right. So the West is unique in that there are many species of Ixtes tick here that can be nidiculous or not. So Ixtes spiny palpus is an example of a tick that is nidiculous. It doesn't quest like the Western black-legged tick, so it doesn't climb to the top of a piece of vegetation and wait for a host. Instead, a nidiculous tick will generally spend its whole life cycle inside the nest or den of its host, and they're often specialised to just feed on a few host species. 
Non-indicolous ticks, on the other hand, feed on many animals, including humans. And this difference has important consequences for us. An indicolous tick, like Ixodes spiny palpus, may well get infected with the Lyme disease pathogen by biting an infected wood rat. But if this tick spends its entire life in the wood rat's midden and prefers to feed on them than, say, humans or dogs, then that is much less of a concern for us than when a questing generalist feeder, like the Western black-legged tick, gets infected. And within the Lyme disease cycle in the West, you can also think of the pathogens as a community. As Andrea said, Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi spirochetes, meaning corkscrew-shaped bacteria. And note that I deliberately used the plural for bacterium there because there are multiple species of Borrelia bacteria that can make people sick. We originally thought that these Borrelia bacteria were all the same, but genetic sequencing has revealed that there are multiple species within what we now call the Borrelia burgdorferi sensu lato group, an umbrella term for all the different species that we now know exist. Until now, more than 20 have been named and at least six are found in California, although I'm reluctant to give numbers because new species are continually being described. And as you can see, although it does depend what genes you're looking at, the genetics of these Borrelia are really similar. So if all these bacteria are genetically very similar and we've gone so long not knowing that they even were different species, why do we care now? Well, we're starting to understand that there are some quite marked differences in the ecology and the pathogenicity between these Borrelias. And by pathogenicity, I mean how sick they can make us. So in California, we have a species called Borrelia californiensis that, as far as we know, doesn't make people sick. Whereas Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, the prototype Borrelia burgdorferi species, can cause Lyme disease. So I'm just going to call it the Lyme disease pathogen from now on. Then we have Borrelia bizetii, which in Europe does cause Lyme disease, but until now there is no evidence really that it causes disease here in the US. And that is where the differences in the ecology between each of these species is so important. As Andrew and I were saying, the animals that ticks feed on vary in their ability to host different Borrelias. For example, squirrels are exceptionally good at vectoring Borrelia, in particular, the, the species that causes Lyme disease. Whereas wood rats are also good hosts for Borrelia, but typically are infected with a species that does not seem to make people sick here in the US. Now, this isn't a strict set of rules, but it can help us to think about where might be best to focus limited resources. For instance, when implementing Lyme disease mitigation strategies in the West. For example, it would be much more beneficial to use bait boxes that attract squirrels and to kill the ticks on them, rather than on wood rats, because they are less likely to be infected with the Lyme disease species of Borrelia. And incredibly enough, the story of Borrelia is yet more complicated in California. So Sharon, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, the Lyme disease, but also the relapsing fever type disease that we have here. Yes, thank you so much, Emily. So the Western black-legged tick carries two principal zoonotic spirochetes, B. burgdorferi causing Lyme disease and B. neomotoi causing a relapsing fever type illness. Human cases of Lyme disease are well documented in California with an increased risk increased risk recognized in the northern coastal areas and the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada range. Despite this well-established presence of B. neomotoi in the human biting western black-legged ticks, clinical cases or human infections with this spirochete have not been well studied in California. However, human infections have been reported in Russia, Europe, Japan, in the eastern Midwestern United States. To broadly assess exposure to Lyme disease and B. miyamotoi in California, 1,700 human sera samples from healthy California residents were tested for an immune response by looking for antibodies to both, to both pathogens. Sampling from no, well-known high endemic and low endemic counties for Lyme disease in California. The next two slides are the spirochetes, Lyme disease, and Borreliae miyamotoi. Of the 1,700 serum samples tested in series, eight or 0.5% of samples tested positive for antibodies for Lyme disease and two or 0.1% of samples tested positive for antibodies to be miyamotoi. There was no significant difference in the seroprevalence for either pathogen between high and low Lyme disease endemic counties. 
Our results confirm a low frequency of Lyme disease and even lower frequency of B. neomotoi infection among healthy adult blood donors in California. However, our findings reinforce public health messaging that there is a risk of infection by these emerging diseases in the state. Andrea's lab has been conducting research on the transmission cycle of the emerging tick-borne pathogen, Borreliae neomotoi. Let's hear what she found. It does appear that Borrelia miyamotoi may be an emerging public health problem in the West. Research in my lab has found that Borrelia miyamotoi infection in all three life stages of the Western black-legged tick. And this is because the adults can actually transmit the pathogen to the next generation in the larvae. Fortunately, the infection in the larvae is relatively low, and, but we found that the infection increased 45-fold from the larval to the nymphal stage, and then two-fold from the nymphal to adult stage. We also found that deer mice are involved in amplifying infection in the tick population. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was so interesting. Can you tell us what you found pertaining to the geographic distribution of B. miyamotoi in California? Sure, so we didn't do a comprehensive uh, geographic survey throughout the state, but we did have sites throughout the Bay Area um, and found that there were regions where there were higher prevalence of infection in the tick population. In particular, the region um, south of San Francisco seems to have a lot of infection in the nymphal tick population. We're not sure what's driving these geographic patterns, but it may have to do with the presence and abundance of species that are important for um, amplifying the infection and transmitting it to the tick population. We have now covered some new research being conducted on the Western Black-Legged Tick. So now those from the California Department of Public Health We'll take you into the field so that you can see where ticks are found. Thanks, Andrea. I'll describe where nymphs of the western black leg tick may be encountered in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains in Northern California. I'll demonstrate how to collect them and most importantly, discuss how everyone can avoid tick bites when they're enjoying the outdoors. During the winter and spring months, Adult western black leg ticks are often found on the tips of tall grasses, especially along the edges of hiking trails in many parts of California. But there are other areas where these ticks may be lurking. In the Sierra foothills, nymphs are more often collected on rocks, logs, and tree trunks than on the grass on the sides of the trail. And this is important because these areas are perfect places to stop and take a rest. And also perfect places for nymphs to crawl up onto you and take a bite. This is my tick flag. I use it to collect ticks by dragging it across surfaces in the environment where ticks may be waiting to grab onto an animal so they can feed. The white fabric makes it easier to see any ticks that might have grabbed onto the flag. Nymphs are very small and can be difficult to see, so I have to check the flag carefully. You can see the size of the nymph in comparison to my hand. They're tiny. When nymphs are found, they are collected, identified to species, and sent to our laboratory to be tested for tick-borne pathogens, such as Borrelia burgdorferi, which are a type of bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Collecting and testing these ticks allows us to determine how commonly western black leg nymphs are infected and helps us inform the public about Lyme disease risks. The Vector-Borne Disease section has been conducting studies for several years on where and when western black leg nymphal ticks are found in the northern Sierra Nevada foothills. Nymph activity begins to increase in February at elevations around 500 feet and can continue into June or even as late as August at elevations up to 4,000 feet. Our studies have shown that up to half of the rocks and logs in an area may have nymphs on them during peak activity months, which are typically April and May. So when you're outside, it's important that you take protective measures to keep ticks off of you. The first that we recommend is that you wear light colored clothing. You can see I have on a white shirt and light gray pants. The second is that you apply an EPA-registered repellent, like DEET, to your clothing and exposed skin. We also recommend that you are constantly checking yourself for ticks as you walk along the trails. Kind of keep an eye on your pants, you know, check behind you, make sure you don't have any grabbing onto you. And finally, when you get home, you can put your clothes into the dryer on the hot temperature cycle and kill any hitchhiking ticks. Thanks for watching. And remember that nymphal ticks can be tiny, and you might not always see them if you stop to take a break on a rock or log, so be sure to wear repellent when you're enjoying the outdoors.
Now recording. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Paddock, and I serve as the lead of the microbiology team in the rickettsial zoonoses branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. I'd like to begin by thanking each of today's speakers for their excellent presentations on ticks and tick-borne diseases in Western North America. These talks, as well as the many others presented during the last several weeks in the Lunch and Learn series, emphasize the increasing relevance of these medically important arthropods. I've always been proud to be an alumnus of UC Davis, which is one of the flagship institutions of the PACVEC COE. I received my master's degree in entomology from UCD way back in 1986. And I think I can safely say that our knowledge of tick-borne diseases in the United States has expanded considerably since that time. If we look at a timeline for the discovery of tick-borne pathogens in the United States, you can see that it was somewhat easier to study for a medical entomology exam when I received my degree. That's to say that there were only nine recognized tick-borne pathogens in 1986. But there were some very important ones at that time. As you can see, these were bookended by Rickettsia rickettsii, the agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and Borrelia burgdorferi, the cause of Lyme disease, both of which were discussed by some of today's speakers. What's even, remor uh, even more remarkable about this timeline, to me at least, has been the discovery of nine additional pathogens in U.S. ticks alone in just the last 34 years. These include several new Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Borrelia, and Rickettsia species, as well as two new viral agents that collectively account for thousands of new cases of tick-borne diseases every year. Just during my professional lifetime, there have been seismic shifts in terms of the recognized diversity of these agents and medically relevant tick species. As it turns out, tick-borne diseases currently account for more than 75% of all vector-borne infections reported nationally each year. Coupled with the rapid recognition of novel pathogens and vector species have been paradigm shifts in the recognized epidemiology and ecology of these diseases. One of the most striking examples being the emergence of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in Arizona and its reemergence in Northern Mexico and the identification of a previously underappreciated vector as we heard in some of the talks today. Looking ahead, I want to emphasize the importance that CDC places on these infections and the crucial need to train the next generation of scientists to continue the work of identifying, mitigating, and hopefully someday preventing these infections. Indeed, training persons to become adept at field entomology is one of the core pillars expected of all COEs. And I believe that the PACVEC training grant program, which leveraged much of the work that we heard today, is a great example of supporting this need. Undoubtedly, there are more agents to be discovered and much more to be learned about the many tick-borne diseases recognized in 2020. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all of today's presenters and their sponsoring institutions and direct the listeners to the various university, state, and CDC websites for more information on these infections. Thank you for your attention and goodbye.